Thanks, everybody. Hello. What an amazing day, right? So before we say anything else, thank you, thank you, thank you to our summit organizers. So as you've heard and as you can see on the screen, my name is Sheldon Himmelfarb, and I've had the distinct privilege of spending the better part of the last three decades working with local change makers, local leaders, local peace builders in conflict zones around the world from Bosnia to Burundi and even in this country in cities like Baltimore. And what we've been doing together is developing technology tools, technology strategies, technology training so that communities could do more, better, faster, since that's what tech does, it's a force multiplier they could do more, better, faster to tackle the drivers of conflict in their communities. Hi, I'm Phil Howard. Uh, I work at the University of Oxford, and our lab has worked for several years now to identify the complex information operations that really degrade public life. My career hit a new low a few years ago when I spent three months studying the most ridiculous campaign to blame COVID on a shipment of lobsters <laughs> that had been sent from Maine to, uh, um, to China, and uh, since then, I've been trying to recover. I think one of, the things, <laughs> one of the ways we've recovered is by documenting very carefully, researching the long thread that connects the people who produce misinformation to the platforms that serve it up, to the politicians who benefit from the chaos. So, Two really different career trajectories, Phil in academia, me working at the local level in conflict zones, but the common denominator between us has always been that we've worked to try to figure out how we could use, how, we, how technology could be used to amplify um, uh, social good. But now we have come together for a different problem. and one that's slow in coming. <laughs> I came in with my ex like Celine or the flex, eh? Bumping Justin Bieber, but a fever ain't left, eh? She know what she need, or I need, or she bless, eh? Giving me my best, eh? Yeah, I got my heart on my sleeve with a knife in my back, what's with that? Anyone I love on them, my brother, that's where it's at, ayy. Bet you made the beat, so you know that it's gon' slap, ayy. Yeah, it's gon' slap, ayy. Tell him, run it back. Talking to a diva, yeah, she on my nerves. She think that I need her, kick her to the car. All I know is you could have had the world. Had the world, yeah, you were my world. Got these girls on my neck, got these girls on my track. Like Selena, baby, on my... So, pretty terrifying, really, um, especially when you see it happening in all quarters of the world like that. So what we've managed to do is actually create a problem so far-reaching that it is rapidly becoming an existential threat to the planet. But this conversation needs to be very much about solutions. I think we've all heard today how misinformation propaganda is targeting science itself diminishing public trust in evidence. There are examples of how this misinformation diminishes our trust in institutions at sensitive moments in public life. Ultimately, information operations degrade our trust in each other and turn some of the world's most complex humanitarian disasters into even more complex disasters. And of course, we've heard throughout the day about AI and how it's about to turbocharge this problem by delivering millions of messages faster than any and smarter than any human being ever could deliver millions of messages, millions of moments designed to mislead. So it's no wonder that our, our policymakers, our governments struggle to keep up. The technology just moves so fast, it moves at a thousand miles an hour. But there are people who can keep up, who do every day, who work on these problems every day. People like our colleague Sebastian Valenzuela from the Catholic University of Chile, one of the world's foremost public opinion researchers. He's been able to demonstrate how social media is critical for young people developing their political identities, 
but can also have a role in fracturing those networks when misinformation, particularly about COVID health, drops into the networks. Colleagues like Young Min Kim, uh, who's established ways of studying how political identity formation happens when platforms rapidly A-B test ads to customize content for their audience. Colleagues like Mona Elswa at the University of Sharjah, who's demonstrated that the vast majority of content that's misinformation in languages other than English originates in a handful of state-backed media outlets where there are political appointees making editorial decisions. Colleagues like Charlton McElwain, whose book Black Software demonstrate this, demonstrates that this infrastructure is still actually very fundamental to the social movements we have now, those working on civic activism, working for social justice, those working to improve our quality of life. Colleagues like my own colleague, Patricia Kingori, uh, a Kenyan researcher based at Oxford who's been able to demonstrate that most people most of the time don't have an appetite for anti-vax information. It's when communities don't have doctors, they don't have a GP, they also don't have a nurse they can check in with. That's the pernicious effect that seems to give anti-vax messaging some traction. And colleagues from, like Princeton researcher Molly, Molly Crockett, she, who studies the neuroscience of the culture wars, she's able to demonstrate how we all experience moral outrage that we perceive in the social and social life as a personal identity threat. And she's able to demonstrate that the social media platforms operationalize this, turn it into a mechanism for manipulation. So you see where Phil is taking us. There's been a lot of talk today about the problems. Luckily, this is the section on hope. And he has been taking us through people where solutions are being surfaced every day at universities, in think tanks, and in um, corporate research. We just have not thought about how to harness that collective power yet. And that's what we're doing today. So it's a pleasure to be able to introduce the International Panel on the Information Environment. This is an initiative that involves researchers from around the world, from the computer sciences, the natural sciences, the social sciences, engineering, and of course, all driven by the great questions, the critical questions that come out of the humanities. This is a large, complex problem that requires many domains of inquiry united to create carefully craft questions and purposefully land on answers. So, a science advisor, a trusted science advisor to coordinate the research to surface the gaps in our knowledge, to surface, to help us prioritize the research questions, and also, most importantly, to develop using evidence-based techniques, developed the, the best solutions to this problem so that we can ensure that the information environment serves humanity instead of destroying it. But it needs to do so at a speed that is commensurate with the urgency of the problem. Fortunately, there are good examples from the last few years of how science can move quickly at scale to solve urgent problems. There's the MNRA vaccine, right, which appeared in very quick, a very quick turnaround, more quickly than any previous vaccine had been developed. The Webb telescope, six months from being launched into space to fully operational through a collaborative team of scientists and engineers. And of course, much of the work that we need to do in this domain will be helped by large language models. So in some ways, AI is a new tool in our toolkit for addressing the problem that we're all concerned about. So, as science is moving faster than ever, so must the IPIE. And we think it is. As you heard, it was two years ago at the 2021 Nobel Prize Summit when we first suggested the creation of such a group. Today, I'm so pleased to say that we have 200 research scientists in our ranks from 55 countries and six wonderful international foundations that are supporting our work. But more important, <laughs> but more important, we already have some outcomes. And tomorrow at 1 o'clock in our breakout session from 1 to 3, we'll be talking through one of the analyses we've done from a, a meta-analysis, a systemic review of some 4,500 scholarly papers published over the last few years about solutions, potential solutions, 
to the information environment problems we see now. And there are many different proposals, but there are two that surface as having pretty consistent positive effects. Flagging content before users go down the rabbit hole into misinformation and providing the corrections, accurate information, at the moment a user, a user encounters misinformation. These are the two most likely, most likely operational changes that we could make to social media to improve public understanding of key issues. So again, in the interest of, of, of demonstrating its value, the IPIE will also release its second study in about a month, which is a global survey of experts on these problems. So the point is, the IPIE is moving swiftly, and it is because it is a group effort. Research scientists from around the world are self-organizing in order to do, frankly, what our legislators, our regulators, and our corporations have really struggled, if not failed to do. And the reason it works is because they can stand on the shoulders of other scientific organizations, giants in science like the IPCC. What a great model for the IPIE and what they've done with climate science. Or the CERN model. Or the Union of Concerned Scientists. I could name several extraordinary scientific organizations that have tackled the greatest challenges of our time. I think for the last few years, as researchers, us with our own teams, have very much been working in our own backyards, studying incredibly complex problems at the far end of the universe with our own telescopes, our own infrastructure. We now need to move forward and start to act collectively to build that infrastructure that will let us see the complex phenomenon for what it is. This is something that's going to be multidisciplinary, that's going to require the insight of the humanities and it's something that we can do together. So, if you are a researcher, a scientist, whether from academia or industry or otherwise, if you are a foundation, if you are a citizen who is eager for an information environment that really delivers truth and trust and hope, then please join us. Thank you.